Hey there everyone, it is Dr. O here. Uh, I wanted to do a quick little review video on some of the vision stuff that we had talked about. Uh, specifically, I wanted to do a little bit of a topic on the retina and some of the cells that you find in the retina because there are a lot of different cells in the retina and it can sometimes get confusing. So what we're going to do here is we are going to take it one cell at a time so we can hopefully get a better appreciation for what every kind of cell in the retina is doing. So the way I have drawn this to begin with is I have drawn the most posterior part of the eyeball. So from the cornea, from the lens, and from the pupil and the iris, go all the way towards the back of the retina and you are looking at what we have drawn here. So the very bottom part here is called the choroid. It is basically the network of capillaries that supply uh, arterial blood to the retina. So you think about how all these cells in the retina are getting nutrients and oxygen. It is the choroid that is supplying it to them. So you have the choroid here, and then sitting on top of the choroid is a single layer of epithelial cells. And this layer is called the retinal pigmented epithelia. Or RPE for short. So you have the RPE cells on top of the choroid blood supply. So RPE cells are the most posterior cell type that you're going to find in the retina. You'll notice that as any epithelial cell is, if you're dealing with a single layer, RPE cells are polarized. They have got their basolateral side here at the bottom facing towards the basal lamina, which I haven't drawn here. It's in between the choroid and the RPE cells facing towards the blood supply. And then up here where you see these little microvilli, these little tentacle looking things called microvilli, that is the apical side of the RPE cell. So good little review on the polarity and structure of typical epithelia. Now then, if we look at the apical side of the RPE cells, we are going to find that these cells are what we call interdigitated with photoreceptor cells. And again, by interdigitated, we just mean there is a very close physical connection between the two cells. So what I'm going to draw here is I'm going to draw a rod photoreceptor and a cone photoreceptor. So I'll go ahead and start with a cone photoreceptor. So uh, not being the most artistically inclined person in the world, I'm going to do my best here. So I will draw kind of a cone shape here for the cone's outer segment. And then I will draw the rest of the cone cell body, which is called the inner segment. And that's going to be where you find the cone's nucleus, as well as, as, well as most of the other organelles. And then the rest of this cone photoreceptor, the outer segment, is made up of big stacked discs that contain all of the rhodopsin uh, molecules that are involved in photoreception, which we had a good talk about. So this would be a cone right here, and then I can also draw an example of a rod, in which case the outer segment is not going to look so much cone-shaped as it is rod-shaped. So you can really get an appreciation for how these different types of photoreceptors get their names. And then similarly, the rod photoreceptor will have an inner segment where the nucleus and most other organelles are located as well. Okay, so here you can see a cone photoreceptor and a rod photoreceptor. So I'm, these are the only two photoreceptors that I'm going to draw just to keep things nice and simple. But obviously, I think you would understand in reality, there are millions and millions, if not billions of rods and cones that uh, maintain close contact with the RP cells all across the retina. The only place in the retina you're not going to find photoreceptor cells is in the optic disc, which we'll talk about here in just a second. 
Okay, so these photoreceptor cells, specifically those rhodopsin pigments, so rhodopsin, we will draw that word right here, those rhodopsin pigments that you're going to find in the outer segment are going to absorb light, which is coming from the most anterior part of the retina, coming from the cornea and the lens and the pupil and all that good stuff that we had a chance to talk about. So this is where the light is coming from. So the light is coming from the anterior segment of the eye and it is being directed towards the most posterior segment. So that light that comes in is going to come in and stimulate these photoreceptor cells right here. So those pigments, those rhodopsin molecules will absorb that light and then we are going to see the electrical signal in terms of neurotransmitter release, action potentials. That nervous system signal is going to go in the opposite direction that the light came from. So this is where the electrical signal will go. Okay, so... Now that we've covered that, let's go ahead and introduce some of our next key players here. So our next type of cell that we are going to look at here that actually forms a synapse with the photoreceptor cells is called a bipolar cell. So a bipolar cell is, like we talked about earlier in the semester, we can distinguish it from a pseudo-unipolar cell, which is what most sensory neurons look like, and multipolar neurons, which is what most motor neurons look like, they are going to have two processes. So I'll draw one here, a cell body where a nucleus is going to be contained, and then another process just like that. And then I will draw another one here. So these are our bipolar cells. They actually synapse on the inner segments of our rod and cone photoreceptor cells. So what that means, since there is a synapse, an actual chemical synapse being formed here, that means that the photoreceptor cells are going to release neurotransmitter onto the bipolar cells and they will trigger a graded potential in the bipolar cells that will, as we've discussed, determine whether or not we get an action potential. So obviously, if we are inclined to send a message in this direction to send a signal to the brain and through the optic nerve telling our brain about the sorts of things that we are seeing, clearly we do want an action potential. But what I'm here to tell you now is that the way this works is a little bit counterintuitive. So what I'm about to tell you is something called the dark current. So as I mentioned, this is a little bit counterintuitive. The way this works is that in the absence of light, when it is completely dark and you are not seeing anything because either your eyes are closed or because you're in a dark room, your photoreceptor cells are constantly releasing inhibitory neurotransmitter. So those red neurotransmitter molecules are of the inhibitory variety, meaning these bipolar cells are going to be in a constant state of hyperpolarization. So think about it, if those bipolar cells are hyperpolarized, are we going to be transmitting any information to the brain through the optic nerve? And clearly the answer is no, because as we've learned before, hyperpolarization is inhibitory. It keeps neural pathways quiet and keeps any information from being released. So this is the way that things are when there is no light stimulation of the retina. When it is completely dark, the reason you are not seeing anything is because those photoreceptor cells using the dark current, which refers to a constant influx 
of sodium into the photoreceptors, I'll just abbreviate that with PR, the dark current refers to a constant influx of sodium into your photoreceptor cells. So they are just constantly depolarized, constantly releasing that inhibitory neurotransmitter. So basically, without making this more complicated than it needs to be, this is the default position of your retina and of your photoreceptor cells. When they are not stimulated, they are excited and they keep those bipolar cells quiet. So hopefully now you can kind of appreciate what I meant when I said this is kind of counterintuitive and a little bit confusing. So the question is what happens when you see something. What happens when light actually strikes the retina? Well, when light strikes the retina, we activate those rhodopsin molecules. We activate a G protein coupled receptor pathway because that's what the rhodopsin is, or at least the opsin part of it. We activate those G protein coupled receptors and that stops the dark current. We uh, without going into too much detail, we activate a second messenger pathway that closes those sodium channels so that the photoreceptor goes back to its resting membrane potential and we stop releasing those naughty inhibitory neurotransmitters. So without those inhibitory neurotransmitters, now we depolarize these bipolar cells and we are now going to fire action potentials in them. So we fire action potentials when light actually strikes the retina. So this is kind of our toggle switch. When it is dark and we are not seeing anything, we keep these bipolar cells quiet with the dark current. When it is light and we see things, we activate rhodopsin, we activate that G protein coupled receptor pathway, and this will lead to action potentials being going through uh, those bipolar cells. But just getting action potentials through the bipolar cells is not where the story ends. So now I am going to draw the last and most important, uh, last really important cell in the pathway. I almost said they were the most important and clearly that's not the case. These are all pretty equally important. So now what I'm going to draw up here is our last cell type here. Draw one for each pathway. So these are the retinal ganglion cells, or RGCs. So the retinal ganglion cells are basically just typical neurons. The retinal ganglion cells synapse with those bipolar cells, which you can see right here, when the bipolar cells fire off their action potentials like we talked about, they will release excitatory neurotransmitter that gets the retinal ganglion cells excited and we will fire action potentials along the retinal ganglion cells. And this is important because the axons of these retinal ganglion cells, which are going off the screen here, all the retinal ganglion cells in your retina, their axons will all converge and form a bundle which we know better as the optic nerve. The whole optic nerve is basically just a big, tightly packaged bundle of retinal ganglion cell axons. So if you get to the point where you fire action potentials through the retinal ganglion cells, that's it. You have completed the circuit here and you are well on your way to sending visual information through the optic nerve, through the optic tract and into the optic chiasm, all the way to the thalamus and then back to the occipital lobe where the visual cortex is located. So this has basically just been a quick little summary of some of the most important cells that you find in the retina. Uh, Everything that you see here, this has not been a complete discussion just for the sake of posterity. Uh, we could have also talked about two other cell types called horizontal cells and amacrine cells. They are not as important to this discussion, so I did not mention them, but if you feel like looking them up and finding out more about them, you are certainly free to do so. But uh, this should complete our discussion on everything uh, going on in the retina. 
Uh, so that should be good enough. So I hope you, I certainly hope you found this helpful. Uh, hit me up if you have any further questions on this. But otherwise, until next time, uh, this is Dr. O signing off.